backed into it. Pull! Pull! Come on, put your backs into it. Pull! Pull! Pull us down if we don't keep going. We've lots more room. I say we go back. No! It's our lives now, not theirs. And I'm in charge of this boat, madam. Now row! This is the captain. Come back to the ship. It's a poignant moment where the great Titanic is sinking, and because of the confidence of the builders, they only put 20 lifeboats on it. So of the 2,200 and some people that were on there, it was only possible to save 1,200. That was the capacity of the lifeboats. But the sad fact is because of the confusion, because the crew wasn't ready, because people left selfishly with partially full lifeboats, only 713 people were saved. Because you see, there was a conflict between those who said, I need to get into the lifeboat, and those who said, the purpose of a lifeboat is to save as many as possible. It was the battle between I'm taking care of me, and God, I think personified in the captain here, saying, come back, there's still more. And it was a risk to go back, but there were more people that need saved. And so in that moment when panic was reigning, when everybody was, every man for themselves, there were some who made selfless choices and some who made selfish choices. And we're in a, a series where we're talking about our spiritual journey and how it is that we grow in our relationship to Christ. And, and I'm going to talk to you about the stages of the journey and so my purpose is for you to, to think honestly and maybe critically about where really am I, but more importantly, am I moving? Am I going somewhere or have I gotten stuck? Because I believe in the spiritual journey, it's easy for us to move along to a certain place and then get stuck. Sometimes we get discouraged, sometimes we get hurt, sometimes we feel like we're just lost in the process. And the question is not, do you ever get stuck? The question is, when you get stuck, do you get unstuck? Because that's how you continue on the spiritual journey. And so we're looking at that picture, and I want to talk to you about the dangers along the spiritual journey. And if you have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 10, or you can open the church app, and uh, you can not only follow out on the sermon outline, do your connect card, but you can also jump over to the YouVersion Bible as we go through the passage. And we're talking about a story where Jesus is out teaching, and he has what I would call a prime candidate to be a great disciple of Jesus, come to talk to him. And we know that this guy from three different gospels, one of them tells us he's rich, one of them tells us he's young, and the third one tells us he was a ruler or some kind of an authority. So we call this the story of the rich young ruler. And he is a prime candidate for following Jesus. If you don't have your Bible, I've got it up here on the screen, and we'll just walk through this story carefully. So as Jesus was starting on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So the first thing that struck me is he falls on his knees. Here's a man who is wealthy, a man who is an authority of some kind, and he's got it together. He's successful. And successful people in Jesus' day didn't run. 
We walked. We're dignified. We're careful. And he not only runs up to him, it says he fell on his knees. He's showing deep respect, maybe even worship. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a great question, isn't it? I think he was really saying, how many more things do I do before I get that badge where I'm going to heaven? But he's asking a great question, and it really struck me. It's funny how when you read different passages of Scripture together, you notice things. Did you remember that last week we talked about the jailer from Philippi? And after the earthquake and after hearing Paul and Silas sing and knowing they were followers of Jesus, he came out, he fell on his knees, and he asked, what must I do to be saved? Almost the same question. Unfortunately, this story turns out very differently than that one. So they come to kind of the same point, and one of them moves on and gets to become a believer and gets baptized, and the other one gets stuck right here. And I think people get stuck often. And the question is, where are we and how fast are we moving? So let's go on with the story. Why do you call me good, Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. Now, some people have tried to say this scripture shows that Jesus didn't think he was God, which is ridiculous from everything else he says. But I think what he's really saying is, do you know who I am? You're calling me good. Why are you calling me good? Do you believe that I'm God or not? Which is a critical question in our spiritual journey is, who is Jesus? And then he goes on to give him an answer. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Jesus gives him a stock answer from the last six of the Ten Commandments, all the ones that have to do with behavior. So he says, you're a Jewish person. You know that God's given us the law. Your way of approaching God in the Old Testament was to be obedient to God's commands, not as a way of proving how good I am, but as a way of coming and realizing how holy God is. And, and this young man's answer says, all these years, I've all these I've kept since I was a boy. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, right? I am a law-abiding Jewish boy. I am fine. He had, he had this strange idea that he had done everything that was needed, and yet, remember, he comes and asks Jesus, what do I need to do to get eternal life? I think he obviously is experiencing something that I think goes on within all of us. If you're in that spiritual journey and you respond to God at some level, there's a sense of satisfaction. I've committed my life to Christ, or at least I come to church and I'm listening. I got baptized. I, I've gotten involved in church and I do this job. And, and we can look at the things that we've done and think, okay, check, 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 I'm doing pretty good. And there's the danger of thinking that we've arrived. And at the same time, underneath in his heart, he's saying I'm fine, but underneath he's saying I'm not fine. I feel this loss, this missing piece. I, I don't know that I have a relationship with Christ. And, and I think it's that I've already come some distance, but there's more to go that should keep us moving. But sometimes it doesn't. It gets us stuck. And I love this line. It said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he loves him, and he's about to give him a zinger that's going to ruin his whole day. But, but it says he looked at him and loved him. And I think that's so critical for you and I as we go through our spiritual journey to realize that God's not saying, what's the matter with you? Get it together. He's looking at us and he's loving us and he's saying, come on, let's get you unstuck. Looked at him and loved him and then he said, only one thing you lack. Oh, that'll be easy. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Wow. This isn't a formula that everybody has to follow to be a Christian. You don't have to sell everything. That's not how you buy your way into heaven. You know what Jesus was doing? He was saying, you've really worked on those last ten commandments or the last six of the ten commandments. You, you've missed the first one. The first one says, you'll have no other gods before me. He's looking at this young man and he's saying, you know what you are is that you're a collector of stuff. And that's your identity. And I want you to be a follower of Jesus. And so he challenges him at the very place where he's most sensitive. And then he listens and looks at it. says, this, at this the young man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Jesus follows up right here with saying, it's difficult for a rich man to get into heaven. And that was the opposite of the Jewish thinking. They thought, if you're poor and everything's going wrong in your life, it must be because you're sinful. And if everything is going well for you, God must be happy with you. You must be like right on the edge. And so Jesus said, this guy who looks like he's got it all together, he's actually in great danger because he thinks his money is more important than his God. And, and you know, I don't know about you, but I'd have run after this guy. Wait, 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 let's talk some more, you know? Come on, let's, let's dialogue. And Jesus just watched him walk away. And I don't know if you think about these like real people, but I wonder if he didn't come back later because he had that kind of a heart. And when Peter stands up and preaches on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 get saved, I don't think it was just because Peter had such a great message. I think Jesus had been planting seeds for three years and they were getting it more and more. And, and I hope that somebody like this guy finally says, okay, you're right. That's the most important thing. Somebody said last night after we watched this, they said, isn't this amazing? Jesus said to him, come be my disciple. He could have been one of that core of disciples around you. He could have been there at the crucifixion and resurrection. He could have seen it all. But instead he chose to play with his toys. He chose to live in his comfort. He chose to keep his stuff. And Jesus is not telling him, come have an awful life. He's telling him, let me tell you how to have a great life and get rid of the stuff that's holding you down. You're trying to swim and your gold's taking you to the bottom. Let me help you out. And so I want us to walk through this process, that the things that cause us to get stuck. And one of it is thinking we've arrived. And ironically, this danger gets greater the longer you're a Christian. I think I've got it together. I know all the basic stuff. I think I've handled some of these problems in my life. And we quit pressing forward and we start coasting. And you see, he had done it with the law, which is God designed the law not to be a checklist so I can feel good about myself, but to see how sinful I am and to realize that I need a Savior. That the law, the commandments of God are to show us how desperately we need a Savior. And he is using it saying, check, 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 I've done that. Can Christians do the same thing? I go to church, I have a Bible, I know my stuff, I got baptized, do, 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 do. And the question in my mind is not really where are you, but what's your velocity? Are you still growing quickly? Are you still moving ahead? You see, there is a battle all the time between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of self. That's part of why when we baptize somebody, we put them all the way into the water because you're saying, I've died to my old self, not only to the sin that needs to be forgiven, you're turning in all of your, this is my life, my stuff, my plans, my dreams, my, 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 my. And you're saying, okay, God, my life is yours now. You tell me where to go and I'll go. I belong to you. And you think, okay, great, that's done. Now we don't have to deal with self anymore, right? Every day you get up in this kingdom of self, some of you more than others. I've seen you early in the morning. <laughs> and every day we have to come again and say, okay, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. It's about what God wants. It's about what he's going to lead in my life today. All the things I have belong to you, God. We have to go back and remind ourselves. And I want to give you some, something that we use as a great yardstick to see how we're moving in our spiritual journey. And we call it the spiritual pathway or the discipleship pathway. And I think sometimes when you see it, if you've been here any length of time, you're going, oh yeah, I know that. And we do the same thing as, we did, as was done with the law. Instead of saying, here's some things I've checked off, I want you to ask yourself, where am I honestly? Because it's kind of like emotional maturity. More people think they're mature than there are. And you ask yourself, where am I? But even more importantly, I want you to ask yourself the question, am I moving or am I stuck? Have I gotten to the place where I've kind of quit the race and I'm stepping off on the infield grass? And so I want us to walk through this simple explanation. You've got it on your outline there. You can write the, the titles in it, and we've talked through this if you've been here any length of time. But let me just explain. A seeker is somebody who is like this young man coming saying, what must I do to have eternal life? And they come to church, or they're coming into your life, and, 
and they're asking questions and they're reading the Bible and they've got a lot of questions that they are working through. And last week we talked about what does it mean to get into the lifeboat? It means to admit that I'm a sinner, A. B, believe in Jesus and who he says he is. C, I make a commitment. And so there's a process of saying, I am no longer a seeker. I am now stepping over and you become a student. And there's so much to learn and there's so many things that that somebody needs to pour into you and help you with and help you understand. And this is a journey. This is a part of your, if you will, your spiritual childhood. And the stages are important But the bridges are tough because it's easy to stay in the student stage and get stuck instead of moving on to the servant stage. And the servant stage says, not only am I going to pull at the oar, but let's go back and pick up somebody else. You begin to have a mindset of how do I pour out my life? I've been given so much. How do I now give to other people? And you begin to become other-centered. And I don't mean just that you have a job at the church and you hand out programs and you're done. What I mean is it becomes a part of your motivation of your life and in your home and in your neighborhood and in your school and at church, you, you have this mindset of giving back. And it doesn't happen overnight, but it is a surrender that says, my time and my resources belong to God. And then we hope you'll make it through this bridge, which is generally a crisis, And you really get to the place where you are Christ-centered. And quite often it's because you found out over time that everything else you live for doesn't count and doesn't last and doesn't ultimately matter. And you begin to say, really, my life is that everything I have, I hope in an old, hold in an open hand and it really belongs to God. And if he lets me enjoy it, that's great. If he takes it away, that's okay too. If he wants me to invest it in somebody else, that's fine that you come to believe that you're the manager of your life instead of the owner. Now, those are a brief understanding of those steps. And I want to just walk through them and see how we can sometimes be moving along and growing and encouraged, and then we get to a place of low engagement. And by that, I mean you get distracted by temptation. You get tired, discouraged, you just want to give up. Sometimes you get hurt by somebody that's a Christian or somebody that's a church member or a church setting. And when that happens, you get stopped, you get stuck. And we're in this process of saying, how do I maintain a high engagement? I think it's part of why we enjoy being around brand new believers. They just have understood what it means to follow Jesus and they have this new life and they're excited. And I think it's exciting to us partly because we're thinking, have I lost some of that? You know, it's just as exciting being saved after 40 years as it was the first year. But we start taking it for granted. We become less grateful and less appreciative and less understanding. So let's talk through those stages. The seeker is somebody who's coming and asking questions. And if you're coming to this church and you're looking at, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And I've got some questions that need to be answered. And I need some information. We're glad you're here. It's a great place. And we hope you're asking, what must I do to have eternal life? like the young man did in the story that we just looked at. But it's possible for you to become stuck, and then you have a professional seeker. And what I mean, if you're here and you've been asking questions about Jesus, and you've been finding out what the Scripture says, and you have your basic questions answered, listen carefully, there's a time when you just need to make a decision. Quit fooling around and jump in. And I don't say that in a mean way. I say that there's a need to finally come to a decision because that's how you get into the lifeboat. That's how you cross over. And you say, but I still have questions. And I say to you, welcome to the club. So do I. You'll never get all your questions answered. You get sufficient questions answered. And you say, okay, now by faith I step out. And I say, I want to become a follower of Jesus. And then I've observed as a pastor that The next step is sometimes the one-shot wonder. And it's kind of funny because people people come to the church and they fill out that connect card and they check every box in the whole thing. Bum, 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 bum. And I think, you know, that's really sad. We're never going to see them again. (laughs) Why? Because they haven't really thought about it. They haven't really considered it. They've just made an emotional decision of some kind. And I think that's exactly what Jesus said when he was telling the story of the parable of the soils. 
that the farmer throws the seed out and some of it goes on hard soil and the birds eat it. But some of it goes on rocky soil and it springs up. There's that quick shot, one shot response. Yeah, I want Jesus. But it says as soon as it gets hard, as soon as there's persecution, as soon as the sun comes out, it's gone. They're here and gone. Some falls on thorny soil. The seed grows up and it says it springs up. But then the, the thorns and thistles, the, the cares of this life crowd it out and choke it out. And pretty quick, it, it's just looking for a good party instead of Jesus. And it dies. And it says the fourth soil is the good soil. And I really think that parable is about people who come to the edge of choosing to follow Jesus and they respond, but then they fall away. As soon as it costs them something, as soon as it's difficult, as soon as it isn't part of what the kingdom of self wants. And that's a sad place to be stuck, isn't it? I think actually that's, we're, we're looking at this, the rich young ruler. Some response, coming to Jesus, kneeling, and then he walks away because he found out that sacrifice is a part of the journey. And then some people move on over to become students. And like I say, there's a lot to learn. This is a big book, and there's a lot of questions to ask and answer. And there's a lot of process in my life to learn how to live as a follower of Jesus in my marriage and with my raising of children and my, my dealing with the situations of, in life. And so I go through that process of becoming a student, and it's easy to learn and to grow, and that's great. But after a while comes the time of stepping over to begin giving back, and some people get stuck right there. They still think that the church is all about me, and the kingdom of self gets them stuck at that place. And I think this will help you understand that there is a church responsibility in this spiritual journey. In fact, if you ask yourself, what's God supposed to do, what's the church supposed to do, and what am I supposed to do? This is a great graph for that. And early in the journey, the church has to provide a lot of resources. How do you hear about Jesus? Somebody has to tell you. How do you start understanding the Bible? Somebody has to show you. And when you come to the church services and when you talk with people, there's a high responsibility through the, the seeker and student phase. But see what happens here? It drops because the church begins to be less responsible for your growth because the personal responsibility begins to come in and it goes from low to high. And the crossover is usually right about in the middle. You see, because now you have to start studying for yourself. You have to start finding places to serve for yourself. Not because somebody just needs an extra worker, but because you have a heart within you that starts saying, how do I make a difference? And let me give you one of the clues that I see. You come to church for a different reason. Instead of coming and saying, well, let's see how good the show is today. Oh, that's a good song. I like that one. Oh, man, the pastor, that was kind of a dud message. It's like you're coming to rate, you're coming to watch, you're coming to, to take in for yourself. And you know what I notice when people move towards servant and steward? They come to check on people who they've been praying for. And, and they're looking around, and they're not just saying, how's the show? They're saying, who's here, and who's not here, and who do I need to follow up on? Who do I need to care for? Why? Because they've quit being just a taker, and they've started being a giver. And when you move to the place of the steward, they're looking for people that are brand new, that maybe they can come alongside and help them get into the lifeboat, people that they can invite to their life group, people that they can answer questions for. And coming to church is not just about me anymore. And when people get stuck, they start saying things like, well, pastor, when the church, when I was a brand new Christian, I really needed you to answer all those questions, but I've got those questions answered. Could you change your preaching now so that it really relates to how much I know and where I need to learn? They don't exactly say that, but they mean that. I'm going to go to a different church where they talk more about end times and stuff, because that's what I'm interested in now. Hmm. I thought this was a life-saving station and you were going to jump on board and help, but I guess you're just a listener of lessons. Do you see the difference? And I think that that part of what happens right there also has to do with our finances. You see, I think one of the reasons Jesus hit the rich young ruler there is because that's a hot spot for a lot of us. And it's interesting. We don't talk a lot about finances here. 
And we don't take an offering because we don't want people who are brand new to Jesus or just checking it and kicking the tires. We don't want them to get offended by an offering plate put in front of them or thinking that that's all it's about is paying for a show. You know, people say, all, all the church wants is my money. I say, oh, no, no, we want all of you. <laughs> it's much worse than that. Your money is probably the easiest thing to give. We want your heart and your life for the kingdom of God. We don't want you just to throw a few bucks in the plate and walk away. And you know, I've noticed every time we come to a big faith challenge, when we say to people, okay, we're going to buy the property next door, or we're going to plant a campus in South County, or we're going to remodel this building, which is hopefully supposed to happen this summer. When we come to those big challenges, we have to say to people, can you give above your regular giving? Can you step in? And you know what the heart of a godly follower says? I want to, whether I can or not, I want to. But you know, every time we make that kind of challenge, some people leave. It's like you're getting personal now. You quit preaching and gone to meddling. You're talking about money. And I think it's sometimes the same problem as the rich young ruler. We've touched on their God. We've touched on the idol that they live for, of success, of being religious, of looking good, and of being wealthy. And you say, well, I'm not wealthy. And I say, <laughs> if you drove here in a car, you're wealthy. We live in a wealthy country. And the sad thing is Jesus said how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. Why? Because all of these things that are anchoring us, that slow us down, we have so many options. It's so easy to get distracted and so people sometimes get stuck at the student phase and they become stuck students. They want to learn. They want to go to Bible studies. They want other people to tell them cool new things they didn't know about the Bible. But you try to get them to get involved in serving and pouring out their life and it's like, sorry, I'm busy. That's my bowling night. And they don't make that transition over to grab an oar and to start being part of the pulling team. They just want to sit and listen. And that's not a bad thing when you're there. A four-year-old is so cute, but if you have a 40-year-old acting like a four-year-old, it's so awful. And it's the same in your spiritual journey. Getting older is mandatory. Getting wiser is optional. And you have to make those choices and say, I want to I follow through. And so maybe you're stuck and, and you can be one of those places. So, so then some people move on to being servants. And they say, I get it, Paul. I've been poured into and now it's my turn to pour into others and you can sign me up for wherever there's needed and I will serve and I will find my sweet spot and I will, I will give more than I receive. That's my new life goal. And God moves us into a place where we begin pouring out our life for others. And you know, we're designed to live for a cause. We're designed to live that way. And you'll never be more satisfied than when you see God use you in the lives of others. It's awesome. And so I never apologize when I ask people to give up stuff that doesn't last and doesn't matter, to invest themselves in things that will be what, what Jesus said to him, then you'll have treasure in heaven. I mean, see, part of why Jesus talked to him about money is because of that same formula, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And conversely, where your heart is, that's where your treasure goes. I can tell you where your heart is, just let me show your checkbook. It's the things you invest in, it's your schedule, it's the things that you invest in. And we can get to be servants, but sometimes we get stuck in that journey too. We become just busy servants. Sometimes all your non-Christian neighbors know is that you're really busy. You drive to a lot of meetings. And we can get thinking that that's the end in and of itself, is just filling functions and doing jobs and doing things that are important. But what happens is that sometimes we lose the heart of it and we quit growing. And then you just begin to continue your functions out of obligation. And you're a busy servant. And I tell you, one of the symptoms is you find yourself bored. You find yourself overwhelmed. You've lost the heart of it, and you've maintained the function. And it's a sad place. People get there. They're, they're like, I volunteered for all these things. Now I can't get anybody to replace me, and I'm stuck doing this. And, and it's this sense... <laughs> I'll tell you a sad fact. I see pastors that are bored with their jobs. And if you're bored with what you're doing, then how can you not be boring when you're sounding, when you're talking about it? 
And the sad thing is we get to this place where we, we've come to the place of giving back, but we've lost the spiritual velocity. We've quit growing and learning for ourselves and moving ahead. And so then some make the step to being the next stage, which is stewards, where we're Christ-centered and it really is all about God. And, and one of the things I notice whenever I see stewards, it's when we're talking about people coming to faith. And when I get to the end of the message and I start giving that invitation, I see people just closing their eyes several places and praying that God will work and that they're invested, not just in their own lifeboat, but in getting other people in the lifeboat. And the picture of a steward is, is a parent and a child. I become convinced that I have something to offer, somebody who's new to the faith. And so I go back and I start pouring in and discipling people and meeting with them. And that's scary. Why, you think, I don't know enough. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the greatest way to keep learning. Because they'll ask you questions you don't know the answers to. What a wonderful gift. How does that get you off your idea that I've got it all together? It takes you away from arrival thinking because you're thinking, I'm going to drown here, God, if you don't help me. And there's a wonderful part where you begin to take somebody by the hand and walk them through the spiritual journey. And when they don't show up at church, you call them. People come to me and say, have you seen so-and-so? I don't know if they're still coming to church. I don't know. Why don't you call them? Why don't it not be my job and why doesn't it become your job? Why? Because God's put that on your heart. Do it. And so we move to the stage of stewards, which is to be celebrated. But I think you can also get to the place where you get tired and maybe retired. And you think, I've already given enough. And there's a lot of other people that I'll turn this over to the young people. And can I say really honestly, in this stage, in this whole process, one of the things I hear happening is people say, I get my feelings hurt. Somebody offended me, didn't go the way I wanted to, pastor didn't do what I thought he ought to do, church didn't do what I thought they ought to do. Let me just tell you, that's one of the things you've got to learn to fight through. When people say, I don't go to church anymore, I had the church hurt my feelings, I feel like saying, sit down, let's talk, it's hurt my feelings too. We got stories. That's because we're sinful people here. God is changing each one of us and we're not finished yet. But when you let that stop you, that's on you. You've got to fight through and you've got to say, that isn't my spiritual journey. It's not hostage to that. It's easy to get discouraged. Sometimes you pour your heart and soul out for somebody and they wipe out. They walk away like the rich young men. You see, I can't can't live on the success of my spiritual giving. I've only got to trust that God's going to do something with what I give him. And I'm going to trust that he knows what he's doing And you know, I I think this story of the rich young man, I hope he comes back. I don't know that, but I hope he does. And you know, I've been here long enough that I've watched people walk away from God and get discouraged or make a bad decision or get into drugs or do whatever, and they crater for a while. And I've been long enough here to see them walk back in. And they say, you know, I tried it out there. It's not that fun. I'm going to come back home. I'm going to come back to Jesus. And you get to be there with open arms saying, come on back in. I don't care what you've done or where you've been. This is where you need to be. And we get a chance to help them get spiritual velocity again. You know, it's really an interesting story how how this story ends with Jesus. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which is kind of a funny joke, than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And the disciples say, if that's true, then who can be saved? Because we thought they were like right on the edge of heaven just about to step in. And Jesus said, actually, they're a long ways down. They're struggling because they've got all these other gods. And then he goes on and he says this. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and he said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. He said, you know, you can't do it and I can't do it. But let me tell you, every person who chooses to trust Jesus and climbs in the boat and says, I'm going to follow Jesus, that's a miracle. And everybody who becomes a student and starts drinking in the Word and God opens up the Scriptures and they begin to to read the Bible not because they should but because they want to, that's a miracle. And everyone that steps on to become a servant and begin to give back and to care for others and instead of thinking everybody should care for me, (laughs) 
cracks me up. People say, I left the church and nobody noticed, nobody called me. And I think, how many people did you call that left the church before you? It's an expectation we have that's not fair at all. We just expect everybody to take care of me. And every person who's chains in their selfishness and begins to live for others in the kingdom of God, that's a miracle. And everyone who goes on to say, God, everything I have, I hold in open hands, my relationships, my time, my resources, it all belongs to you. Everybody that becomes a steward, it's a miracle. And God is in the business of miracles. Every growing church is a miracle. Every loving family is a miracle. And I think we begin to think we can do it ourselves and we can't. But every time you realize and honestly admit, I am stuck, don't think it surprises God. It probably doesn't surprise anybody in your family either. And you admit it and you say, I need help. God, bring me along. Help me get going again. That is a prayer that God will always answer because that is His desire for you. And I think we need to see Him, just like with the young man, looking at us in love and saying, won't you come back? Won't you let go of that stuff? Won't you give up that hurt? Won't you give up that tiredness? Won't you give up and come back and get back on the path and get growing again? I'm going to release to our campuses in South County and Green and Love you guys and trust that God's going to help Sky and Will as you close this up. Let me ask you two quick questions. If I were to ask you right now, how is your spiritual velocity? How excited are you about the fact that you're in a relationship or you're considering a relationship with God? How much is that a center of your day and of your week and of your life? How much are you aware that you're changing in how you see the world and how you see people? Are you growing? Because when you're growing, there's this sense of joy. There's this sense of God's using me. God's speaking to me. God's working. There's there's a sense, what Jesus said, it's an abundant life. And if you're saying, Paul, I'm not feeling that. I'm feeling like it's an obligation. It's like I should do, like I'm caught, like I'm hurt, like I'm angry. You're stuck. And the good news is God's in the business of getting unstuck people unstuck. And He may come and He may put His finger on your heart in the very place you don't want Him to and say, you need to get rid of this. You need to start doing this. You need to follow me. And somebody, as they mentioned, that that young man could have maybe been one of the 12 disciples following Jesus, having an eternity ahead of him, but he kept his stuff. And that's all he had at the end, his stuff. So what's your spiritual velocity? And be honest if you're stuck. Don't, don't be ashamed of that. Be open about it. Because the next question is, what's it going to take to get you unstuck? And I like the, the message that John writes to the churches in Revelation, to the Ephesian church. He says, return to your first love. Do the things you did at first. Go back and remember why you got saved and what Jesus means and what's important. And, and I'll tell you the opposite. Go back to the beginning and then go to the end. How are you going to wish you had lived when you get to the end of your life? I told you that one of my favorite bumper stickers is live so your pastor doesn't have to lie at your funeral. You know? Because <laughs> if you get to the end, you will know what's important. And you know what you'll find out? A lot of the things you stressed about, a lot of things you worried about, a lot of things you focused on are gone. And the things that matter and the things that last will not only be there, they're going to be in forever. So think about your life in that way. And I'll be praying for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your life in us. Thank you for the peace and joy that you offer. Thank you for the the way that you come alongside us when we get stuck And you help get us out of that hole. You help us get traction. You help us forgive. You help us go back to doing what's most important. And God, keep us from just bouncing around every time a circumstance changes or every time a friend changes. And help us to be consistent and steady in our journey with you. And I pray for those that are stuck seekers, that they may choose to commit themselves to you and to believe for those who are students, that they may commit themselves 
to beginning to give more than they get, to teach others for those that are servants that they might move on to being stewards and live for how they can invest in your kingdom. God, thank you for those people that you give us in our life that are ahead of us in the journey that model for us those great attitudes. Help us to keep moving ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.